What's up guys, Chase Oliver here, bringing you another video to my channel, and I am bringing back the classic pay-per-view reviews. I'm so excited to bring these back to my channel, but before I get started with my SummerSlam 2004 review, let me talk about the little changes that I'm going to be doing with this series. When it came down to the old school format of how I used to do classic pay-per-view reviews, you know, I would always ask people, all right, comment down below which pay-per-view you want me to review next and give it a thumbs up. Well, the problem is when people would find my channel through searching old pay-per-view reviews, they would find this and they would be like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, review WrestleMania 17. And, you know, they would always ask me for the same shows that or shows that I've already reviewed. So I do have a playlist of shows that I've already reviewed and there should be all the shows in there that I should have reviewed. Uh, WrestleMania 17 is actually not in the playlist because that video is way fucking old. So I might do a redo of a WrestleMania 17 review down the line, just not now. I want to make this like more continuity, make this more theme-ish. So I'm going to give themes for each week. So for the next classic pay-per-view review, I'll ask like, what's your favorite SummerSlam or something like that. Keep it what with what I'm doing so that way it's more continuity and it's not like, you know, I go from SummerSlam 2004, what I'm reviewing right now, and then all of a sudden, LOL, I'm reviewing ECW December to this member. So for the theme for the next classic pay-per-view review, which will happen next Sunday on my channel, I want to know from you guys, what is the worst SummerSlam of all time? Leave your comments down below and on Friday on my Twitter, I'll announce which SummerSlam I'll be reviewing for you guys next Sunday, but I hope you guys do enjoy my SummerSlam 2004 review. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, Chase, we know why you chose SummerSlam 2004. It's obvious. If you're new to my channel, obviously you don't know who my favorite wrestler is, but a lot of people who are uh, subscribers of mine for a long time, they know why I probably chose SummerSlam 2004, and that's not the main reason why I chose SummerSlam 2004. Don't don't think it was a contributing reason. It was a contributing reason that my favorite wrestler did win his first ever world championship at this event. So of course I am going to choose this pay per view, but it was more or less that I wanted to go on a nostalgic trip. You know, I'm 21 years old, and I watched this pay per view when I was 11, and I haven't seen this show in full since the event first aired. I know a lot of people are probably surprised about that. I watched the main event match probably five or six times in my life, but the full event, I haven't watched in a long ass time. So I said, you know what? Let me go on a nostalgic trip. Let me feel like I'm at my grandma's house again, watching SummerSlam 2004. And that's what it was. Like, I remember just sitting there watching SummerSlam 2004 in my room. And I was like, man, dude, this just feels like when I was a little kid again. So I just wanted a little bit of nostalgia when I was watching this pay-per-view. And I definitely got that. We kicked off the show with the Dudley Boys taking on the cruiserweights of Rey Mysterio, Paul London, and Billy Kidman. This feud was just pretty much built up around the cruiserweight division and Spike Dudley. He was the boss of the Dudley Boys at the time. I love the boss Spike Dudley. That guy was hilarious. Spike Dudley, this was definitely... One of Spike Dudley's highlights in his career. You know, they had a really good mixture of cruiserweights. You know, Rey Mysterio was always an established cruiserweight wrestler. Same with Billy Kidman, even back to the WCW days. But Paul London was an interesting guy. He was kind of a new face in the cruiserweight division. And they were really trying to focus on Paul London being a threat to Spike Dudley at this time. And I felt they did a really good job with it. The Dudley boys end up being the cruiserweights in this match. It's a fine opening matchup. But I forgot this was the opening match. I actually thought another match opened the show. I thought John Cena versus Booker T in the Best of Five series opened up the show. But I guess I was totally wrong about that. But this was definitely a, a, fine, a fine opening match. And I felt it kicked off SummerSlam 04 in a good way. We had Kane versus Matt Hardy in the Death to Us Part match. And, oh, God. That Kane and Lita feud. I just didn't get it. I, I didn't know what WWE was trying to do at this time with Kane's character because, you know, Kane, he was just pretty much lost in the shuffle. After he took off the mask, you know, he had that epic stuff with Shane and RVD. That was really, really good. And then afterwards, it was just kind of like, all right, now what do we do with Kane? Oh, uh, let's have him feed with Undertaker. All right, now let's just have Kane, you know, put his demon baby inside Lita. And it, it, it just made no sense. I just didn't really care for it that much. You know, yeah, I liked Matt Hardy, but it wasn't like Matt Hardy was a threat to defeat Kane in this match. There was no way in hell Kane was losing to Matt freaking Hardy. Kane ends up winning, and then we get that marriage segment on the Monday Night Raw, I believe, like two weeks after. It, it wasn't a good match. Kane and Matt Hardy did not do well in this match whatsoever. Um, that's all I could really say about it. Was not really a big fan of it. 
Now, the third match, John Cena and Booker T, actually is one of my favorite United States title feuds, the best of five series. This goes back to, you know, what Booker T used to do back in WCW with, you know, the television championships and the United States championships. Booker T used to be in a lot of, you know, best of seven series uh, featuring those titles. And it was kind of nice for John Cena to have a best of five series with Booker T. You know, Booker T, he was a really, really good worker, really underrated. I think a lot of people don't give Booker T the credit he deserves. And, you know, here was a John Cena at the time that, you know, was actually vulnerable and actually cool to watch. He was the rapper, and it was a great dynamic, him and the Booker T feud. I, I, I honestly think Booker T doesn't get enough credit for making John Cena into a star. That's just my personal opinion. Booker T was a perfect heel for John Cena to face, beat John Cena for the United States title. John Cena said you couldn't do it five more times. Booker T said he could, and so they set up the best of five series. John Cena beats him in the first match of the best of five series for the United States title, and it led on to really, really good matches all the way up to, I believe, No Mercy 2004. So definitely one of my favorite mid-card matches. It was a good match. I enjoyed watching it. Now, the next match was actually interesting. It was a triple threat match for the Intercontinental Championship. Edge was the Intercontinental Champion at the time, taking on Chris Jericho and Batista. Now, the thing about this was this event was held in Toronto, Canada. They made a big deal about how this was in Toronto and Edge was supposed to be the hometown boy but when Edge came out he was getting booed Edge was getting booed out of the water Jericho was a clear favorite and even Batista who was a part of that heel evolution faction day he was getting more cheered than Edge Edge was just getting booed out the water and at the time you know the Edge character it never really changed this is what started the change to the, you know, the whole rated R superstar character that Edge would eventually become. Because, you know, at the time, Edge was just such a bland baby face. You know, he got injured in 2003 when he was really, really hot, when Edge was rising up the cards of a mid-card superstar to possible main eventer for the WWE. He got injured. He was out for a long time with a neck injury. He came back in 04 on the Raw brand, defeated Randy Orton for the, for the IC belt. And, you know, it felt like Edge was doing good as a baby face. But he started to lose traction because there was nothing to this Edge character. I mean, sure, he had the Rob Zombie theme, but what else did Edge have? He didn't have anything. And so the fans in Toronto were booing him. It's always funny looking at Edge's expression where he's like, how are you guys booing me? But this ultimately led to the Edge turn. I didn't feel like Edge was the right guy to win the IC title match at the time. I really thought they were going to give the belt to Chris Jericho. I thought they should have just given the belt to Jericho. I didn't feel like Edge needed the IC championship here. But... Edge ended up retaining the IC Championship. It was a fine triple threat match. Nothing really to write home about. Now, the next match is a really, really good match. Uh, Kurt Angle versus Eddie Guerrero. This spanned from, you know, WrestleMania 20, you know, when Eddie Guerrero defeated Kurt Angle to retain the WWE Championship. And then ever since, you know, Kurt Angle, you know, his career was kind of just like bouncing up and down since that loss. You know, he became SmackDown GM. Big Show chokeslammed off the freaking, like, I believe it was like a stage, and, you know, he was in a wheelchair. Eddie lost the WWE Championship to JBL, and Kurt Angle, um, in, a, in a rematch, Eddie Guerrero was facing off against JBL inside of a steel cage, and it was revealed that Kurt Angle was this masked man who's been attacking Eddie Guerrero, and that he could walk, that he didn't need the wheelchair. He was fine, and it made Kurt Angle look like a big joke. Vince McMahon was embarrassed from him. Eddie was pissed off at him, and it was just a personal rivalry. And the match itself, this is a good match. I like this match. Like here, I like the storytelling, especially because they played off from the WrestleMania 20 match. Because if you guys remember, at the end of the WrestleMania 20 match, Eddie Guerrero like took off his boot and beat Angle with the roll. When Angle was going for the ankle lock, Eddie beat him by kicking the boot off of him. Angle was like, "What the boot?" Eddie beats him with like. Cheap little roll-up. We, we try to get the same story here where Eddie, you know, he's pretty much, you know, taking off the boot. You're like, oh, it's going to happen again. Kurt's going to get get pranked into this. Kurt realizes what Eddie's doing, rips off the fucking boot, grabs that fucking ankle and starts twisting it. Oh, it was just beautiful. I love this match. I know a lot of people don't give this match love. They don't think it's really the best angle in Eddie encounter. But for me, in a storytelling sense... This was a really, really good match. And it's a shame that they didn't really continue to feud as personal as it is. I mean, really, to be honest, they kind of just dropped this feud. Eddie kind of just went on to face off against Luther Reigns uh, during at this time. And Kurt Angle went on to feud with the returning Big Show. Even though Kurt Angle and Big Show made sense, I really felt they had a lot more money left in the tank to, you know, do another Kurt Angle and Eddie match. It, 
really, really good match. One of my personal favorites from SummerSlam 2004. <laughs> Speaking of personal favorites, Triple H and Eugene <laughs> in a no DQ, no holds barn match. I loved Eugene. I, I don't care what anyone says. I, I love the Eugene character, and I loved how Triple H would use Eugene. I always loved those segments where Triple H was in the bouncy house, and he was jumping up and down with Eugene. He's like, guys, we're doing this so that way I can get the title, ugh. I really, really did like this. And, you know, Eugene was that one character that I don't know why. Maybe because I was an 11-year-old kid and I could just sympathize with him because, you know, he was like a big kid in the WWE. Just know, I was 11 years old. So, you know, the whole term of, and I don't really use this term rarely, but, you know, the whole thing of being a retard or special ed person, I, I, I did not know that at the time. I just felt Eugene was like me inside of the WWE ring. I, I loved it. He would use the Rock's move. He would use Hogan's move. You know, he would hook up. He would Eugene up it, do the airplane spin. I thought this was a really good match. I, I really did it. <laughs> I, it's a personal favorite of mine. It really is. And I like at the end of the match because Triple H wins. He's not going to put over Eugene at SummerSlam. Are you kidding me? Gain, the god of WWE putting over Eugene out of all people? Nah, screw that shit. Triple H hit the pedigree one, two, three after Sledgehammer. <laughs> but I always loved the ending of this match where Triple H was like dragging an unconscious Ric Flair by his tie. <laughs> That was awesome, but this is definitely a fun match. If, if you are not insulted by the Eugene character and you can just let aside of what his character was and you can just sit back and enjoy a good story that Triple H told with Eugene, and I felt this feud was hot too. I really did. I felt this feud was very, very hot. I was down with the Eugene character. And so, you know what? If you can just let aside, let, let, like, let your feelings aside of how you feel about Eugene as a character and how stupid it was, and just watch this match for what it is. It's actually a pretty good match with a pretty good story. So I really do love this match. It's one of my personal favorites. But in terms of quality, it's just pretty good. Oh, God. Up next is JBL versus The Undertaker. And this wasn't a good match. It wasn't. JBL and Undertaker just had no chemistry. You know, Undertaker was just coming back to the WWE. He recently killed Paul Bearer at the Great American Bash by lowering the cement down. And so, you know, we had this big SummerSlam match between, you know, the wrestling god, you know, JBL, WWE champion against the dead man, the Undertaker. Ended in a stupid disqualification. And then afterwards, Undertaker goes, grabs JBL, Last rides him through, you know, pretty much his limo. And that was just pretty much it. Like, this match is not good. This is not a good WWE Championship match. Like, I, I almost wanted to skip it, but I was just like, nope. I got to sit through it. And I just remembered it was just so bad. But now, it's time to talk about the main event of the evening. And I bet you a lot of people were waiting for this when this video started. They were like, oh, let's see what Chase has to say about his boy, Randall Keith Orton. Taking on the rabid Wolverine, Chris Benoit, for the World Heavyweight Championship. And it's a shame that this match is not remembered because of the incident that happened with Benoit. You know, nowadays we just always joke around that, oh yeah, Randy Orton beat Stevie Richards for the belt. Or Randy Orton found the title underneath the ring. Like, you know, we always joke around of how Randy Orton became the World Heavyweight Champion. It's such a shame because this was actually a good match. And I remember when I was a kid, I didn't think they were going to give the belt to Orton. I really thought Triple H was going to come out during this match and, you know, kind of cost Orton in a way, you know, like try to act like he was helping Orton and, you know, use a sledgehammer on Benoit, but the referee, you know, he would have sought at the last minute and then it would have led to a DQ and then lead to another one of those awesome Triple H and Chris Benoit matches that we were just getting sick of in 2004. I'm sorry, Chris Benoit and Triple H can put on good matches, but in 04, these motherfuckers had matches like almost every single week on Raw. I was just getting sick of it. I was actually really, really surprised you know, of how much the Canadian fans were behind Randall Keith Orton in this match. Like, if you remember, I, I was, like, so shocked because Benoit was just, like, a, a huge fan favorite at this time. You know, he would always get a good reaction. The fans really cared about him. They were happy that he was World Heavyweight Champion. And it was just weird, you know, when Randy Orton came out, you know, the fans were cheering during the whole match. The fans were cheering for Orton. The, during the finish, Randy Orton hits the RKO and the fans were cheering. I was just like, oh, my God, the fans were cheering for Randall Keith Orton during this whole match. But I also think this match is not only just famous for, you know, what it accomplished with Randy Orton and him becoming the youngest world champion, but I also think this is the match that established the Randy Orton ring boner. 
Yes, this is the match where the Randy Orton ring boner was established because do you remember what he was wearing? He was wearing these ridiculous orange tights. And you could tell right away he had a ring boner because right when he fucking entered the ring and he did his damn pose, it was those ugly ass orange tights and his big old cock just showing through them. It was just, oh my God. This is where the Randy Orton ring boner first started. This is what I truly believe where this first started. But the match itself was good. It was not a great Chris Benoit match. I don't think this was one of Chris Benoit's great matches, nor do I think this was Randy Orton's great matches. I mean, both these guys had much better matches earlier on in this year. Obviously, Benoit with the triple threat at WrestleMania 20 and Randy Orton with his match with Mick Foley at Backlash 2004. This was just a good World Heavyweight title match with definitely a surprising result of Randall Keith Orton defeating Chris Benoit and becoming the youngest World Heavyweight Champion at, at this time. And you would think, you know, when Randy Orton won the World Heavyweight Championship, you know, only at the age of 24, who would have thought John Cena, who was in the mid-card of this pay-per-view, fighting Booker T for the United States Championship, would be the 15-time world champion, be the one that's knocking on Ric Flair's door. How many of you guys back in 2004 thought Randy Orton would be, probably be the one that could be knocking on Ric Flair's door at becoming the you know 16-time world champion? I mean, the dude was only 24 when he won his first world title. You knew that this guy probably had you know so many years left with him, left in his career, just being at a young age of 24. And he won the world title then. And it's so surprising that the dude who was in the mid-card rapping and stuff with Booker T for the U.S. title is the guy that's knocking on Ric Flair's 16th world title reigns. Not Randall Keith Orton, but John Cena. And that's just shocking to me how 10 years have passed. Um, in all honesty, I was happy when Randy Orton won. Definitely one of my favorite Randall Keith Orton moments. You know, it's never really remembered at the way that it is because of the Benoit tragedy that happened. It's just always that Randy Orton found the title randomly, or he defeated Stevie Richards, or he defeated a mysterious opponent. Whereas Ace the Wrestling Nut once told me that he, uh, Eugene, had a Randy Orton action figure pin a Triple H action figure, and that's how that match hat ended. You know, you know, it's it's just a shame that this moment is not remembered because it is a huge moment. You know, we crowned the new youngest world champion. Obviously, I think WWE did this to spite Brock Lesnar because Brock Lesnar did leave the company earlier in 2004, and he had the record as the youngest WWE champion ever. And then all of a sudden, they're like, screw you, Brock. You leave us. We're going to make a younger and better star. And we could make Randall Keith Orton at this pay-per-view, the youngest world champion at 24 years of age. A glorious moment for me as a Randy Orton fan, definitely for sure. But overall, SummerSlam 2004, there is some duds on this show. I personally do like this show, but overall, if I were to be a reviewer when it comes down to it, it's not that good of a show. You know, I feel like some of the mid-card matches do deliver in a sense, but I feel it's like the main matches, they didn't deliver all that much. Like JBL versus Undertaker, not really that good of a match. Triple H and Eugene delivered well. I felt Angle and Eddie told a really good story, but not the best Angle and Guerrero match overall. And the main event was just kind of good. It wasn't really a great match between Randy Orton and Chris Benoit. It was definitely a, a nice technical match, but it wasn't exciting throughout whatsoever because a lot of people just expected Benoit to win this match, but we got that surprise win of Randall Keith Orton becoming the World Heavyweight Champion. So, in all honesty... It was a fine pay-per-view. I wouldn't say it's one of the best SummerSlams of all time. It's probably one of those middle-of-the-road SummerSlams. Like, people will watch and say to themselves, you know what, SummerSlam 2004, actually pretty solid show. But I want to know from you guys, what did you guys think of SummerSlam 2004? Did you like this show when you first watched it? Did you not like this show? What was your favorite match on this show? Obviously, my favorite match, besides maybe the Randy Orton versus Chris Benoit match, would probably be the Angle and Guerrero match. I totally forgot how good of the story they told in the middle of the ring. I really did like this match. So tell me all that down below. Remember to choose what is the worst SummerSlam of all time in the comment section down below as well. Make sure you guys check out the description box to follow me on Twitter at ChaseOver68. Check out my website, ChillingWithChase.com. Anyways, guys, I'm out of here. Hope you guys enjoyed SummerSlam 2004 review. I'll see you all next time. Peace.